Thank you, everyone, for joining me. Uh, my name is McKeel Haggerty, and uh, I want to welcome you to a seminar that I have been wanting to do for a long time. Uh, so we're going to have some fun with it. We have a very interactive uh, opportunity in this whole thing, but I think a lot of great information. Um, I know it's a really busy time for a lot of us when we come to these events, so if there are other things that you have to do or we just bore you to death, don't bother me. It's not going to bother me if you get up to uh, come and go. I know some people probably will be joining us. Um, but I know when I see that video, I start thinking about summer in northern Michigan. That's all I'm thinking about because we uh, certainly have not been having a lot of weather like this. Uh, but one of the big reasons that we do these things um, at Haggerty is that, you know, I believe uh, knowledge and, and information is power when it comes to uh, collecting cars. You know, we, all of us here, you, you know, you guys are already part of the initiated. You've already drunk the Kool-Aid as it comes to um, owning cars, collecting cars, that sort of thing. And so you already know a lot. Um, and probably a lot of what you come to when you see something like this is maybe confirming of something that you already know. <laughs> But you know, if we can make, maybe make you think about things uh, sometimes differently, give you a little edge on the next time that you go out there and, and decide to buy something and new and add it to your collection, um, that's what we try to do when we put one of these seminars on. And it's also, I think, part of the mission of what uh, Bill Warner's always been trying to do here at the Amelia Island Concours, which is to help people you know, gain uh, access to different sorts of information, make people out there that uh, you may not normally get to see or meet or hear from, uh, you know, to sort of bring them to the light of day and to hear their own voices talk. But I can absolutely tell you in this seminar, and we're going to get going here, um, this is not an entry level um, collecting seminar. There is nothing in here that we are going to talk about uh, that is sort of, um, sort of at the normal level of collecting for a lot of people. These are the cars that have absolutely defied gravity. Uh, when it comes to the economic downturn that happened in 2008 uh, and even leading up to it, these are cars that have been, in, for the large part, perpetually collectible uh, during all eras. And as we're going to talk about um, at sort of throughout it also, these we're going to be talking about cars and trends of collecting sort of around the world because there are a lot of cars that we're seeing and that you're going to see here this weekend that are collectible all over the world, uh, almost anywhere. So there's a, there's a much uh, larger demand. Um, so we put together a panel of experts. I think, um, well, there's cert it's certainly the greatest group of experts in the room at this time. Let's put it that way. We're going to, um, we'll, we'll start with that. And I'm um, starting from the left, Michael Sheehan um, is the owner and CEO of FerrarisOnline.com. Uh, he lives in Southern California, and he is a 35-year veteran in the uh, restoration and brokering of Ferraris, Lamborghinis, and Maseratis. Um, he's a noted Ferrari historian and valuation expert, and he writes a monthly column for one of our favorite publications, Sports Car Market, and also for Forza Magazine. So, Michael, thank you for being with us. Uh, next to Michael is Colin Comer, um, sort of helping us bring the average age down the room. Thank you. But, you know, the hair, you, I'm envious of your hair, but that's another <laughs> matter altogether. Uh, Colin is one of the foremost authorities on all things having to do with Shelby. And uh, he has some best-selling uh, uh, books uh, that have been, in fact, I think one of them was most recently the top-selling book in the automotive category on Amazon, yes? Yep. And that's uh, Million Dollar Muscle Cars, The Complete Book of Shelby, and the just released Shelby Cobra 50 Years. So very timely that we're talking about this during the 50th anniversary of the his Cobra. His mom bought 500 copies on Amazon. Oh, yes, <laughs> I see. I know how that works. Um, yeah, how full is your garage of those books? <laughs> We're not going to talk about it. But he's a significant collector, a vintage racer, and also a pilot, I found out today. So, you know, we're in capable hands. Uh, Dave Kinney uh, on the right, a 25-year uh, veteran in a, of the uh, appraising and publishing world. He's a publisher of um, our own Haggerty Price Guide. Uh, he begun his, uh, his uh, life in the classic car world uh, working in a dealership that sold classic and exotic cars. And he's owned hundreds of vehicles himself. Some of them maybe not the best choices, but that's a subject for another um, time. So you've cornered. That, that's you've, a subject on a couch, I yes, think. Yes, you've, so, you've yeah. cornered yeah. a lot of markets that did not need to be cornered. Let's put it that way. Um, so uh, a wealth of knowledge, both for the good, the bad, and the ugly. So, but you know, I'm, uh, we decided when we put this seminar together that we were going to start right at the top. We're going to go right after it. So the first segment is uh, we're going to be talking about Enzo era Ferraris, and we're going to go absolutely right to the top, and Michael Sheehan's going to help us understand the nosebleed values that we all see 
so that we can all go away from this and have better cocktail party banter. So um, about you know, these things, because a lot of us will never be able to afford some of these cars. So why don't we start right off, um, Michael, with the top dog. Which, of course, is the 250 GTO. Yes. And the 250 GTO was the weapon of choice for racing in 1962, 63, 64. They won everything. They were simply the best GT car out there. And as a consequence, uh, they're the weapon of choice today for those who want to say they've arrived. If you want to be known as a Ferrari collector, you've got to have one. If you're really serious, if you're writing the really big checks, if you want the best of the best, it's the car to have. So what is it that makes these? I mean, we, you know, there was this reported sale and the $30 million. Everybody certainly talks about them being in that price range and up. You know, what is it that makes this particular car so special and that the five or whatever it was on the tour collectively are worth more than this hotel? <laughs> um, yeah, which is pretty amazing. Uh, and probably more liquid, too. Um, <laughs> the, uh, as I said earlier, the GTO has been the weapon of choice. It's one of those rare cars where um, a, a rich guy who has no racing experience can buy one and look good. It's one of those rare cars that makes a bad driver look good. It does everything right. Um, I've, I've raced all kinds of things, and, and the GTO is one of those wonderful, wonderful balances of the right amount of horsepower with the right amount of tire with the right amount of, of gearing and the white, right weight distribution. More important, it looks right. It's just a stunningly gorgeous car, um, which explains why the GTO is twice the price of the uh, 250TR, which is more or less the same car underneath. Mm -hmm. So, uh, I mean, where do you, I mean, is there, is there an end to this? I mean, you know, is this just the car, I mean, is this where, remember when Van Goghs were selling for tens of millions of dollars and then all of a sudden Picasso, you know, wasn't there a Picasso, I think, that sold last year near $100 million? Is that, is that how rare these are? There were 39 Ferrari GTOs. I went to Europe in 72, and when I came back, I wanted to buy a GTO. And uh, there had been a few drifting around LA in the $6,000 range, but they jumped to $7,500, and so I waited for them to come down, which was <laughs> obviously not the best move. Um, I can remember when the first one sold for 100000 I can remember when the first one sold for a million. And to be very candid, it's not going to stop. It is simply not going to stop. Um, it's interesting that it is the most collectible, the most desirable. Um, think about it. If, if you have a Ferrari collection, buying a GTO instantly says, I've arrived. I have the best. You know, everybody knows who you are. Everybody in the industry knows who you are. Whether you want them to or not, everybody knows who you are. So uh, and it's the ultimate weapon. And that has, has trickled down um, where you essentially have, have two tiers. You have the GTO, the TR, the you know, TDFs, 500 TRC. And then further down, of course, you have the, we'll call it the production uh, Anzuera cars like the Daytonas and Dinos, 330 GTCs, which are the gold standard of the, I think I can afford one kind of cars. Okay. You don't have to sell your hotel to buy one. Yeah, yeah exactly. So we were, we were uh, chatting earlier about this idea that, you know, in and this is a trend that can happen in a lot of parts of the car world, which is, is this the, also the ultimate iteration of a series of cars? I mean, this was for the ultimate of the 250s, wasn't it? Yeah, the, the GTO was the last of the 250 series, if you exclude the, the 250 LM, which really wasn't a 250, it was a 275. But, uh, you know, it's the last of the front engine. Uh, and again, what's really the most important is it's so easy to drive fast. It just does everything right, whereas I'm five foot nine and I can't, barely crawl into a 250 LM. You know, 250 LM is one of those cars that makes a really good driver look really busy, whereas the GTO makes a really bad driver look good. That's a great line. Okay, so that's the nosebleed section. Let's come back down to maybe the coach class, or is this maybe business sec the business class uh, section, which is, the, which is the Testarossa. You know, we've seen a couple of big sales of Testarossas recently. And, and by the way, the, the cars and the values that we're putting on here are um, sales and, and values that have been sort of verified or they've been published by auction companies. Uh, so we're not trying to pick one car over another. We're trying to use them as examples. Um, but 
Let's talk about Testarossa. So this is half the price. Half the price, but it's not half the car. It's, it was a, an equally a successful car, but it's a lot easier to relate to a GT car than a sports racer. Um, this is also a car that makes a bad driver look good, but um, I drove one on the Millimilia and flew straight home and checked into the hospital with pneumonia. You know, it was a miserable experience. I mean, I loved it. It was a 250 TR on the Millimilia, but I was wet for three days because oh. <laughs> it rained for three days. <laughs> that's, that's so it's, it's um, not as user-friendly. Um, it it does, simply doesn't have the same panache. Uh, essentially, everybody knows, a, you know, everybody knows what a Ferrari is, and everybody who's into really collecting knows what a GTO is. The, the TR isn't as well known, um, wasn't, at, well, it was very successful, but not as successful. And it wasn't run by privateers and there weren't as many made. So it's um, the same type of car, but a bargain at half the price. Just a bargain. It's Just 16, a bargain. $16 million. So, so do, you, do you feel that, you know, during the time when these cars were being raced, and as you said, when you first started seeing them for $6,000 in, in, in classified ads. TRs were cheaper. T TRs were cheaper. Should have, you could have bought two. Um, is, was there a difference between the way the world, or maybe Europeans, looked at these cars and then how Americans sort of fancied them? Or was this a difference in the racing that was going on in this country at the time or later? When I entered the business in the 70s, there was gazillions of cars for sale. You, you literally could buy Miras and Daytonas and 375 MMs on car lots in Orange County, which is hard to believe, but true. Um, but as my age group, the baby boomers, have moved on, they brought these cars with them. Um, for instance, we all know of the boom in 1989, 1990, when you know GTOs hit $15 million and TRs hit $5 million. And that was a baby uh, boom-driven um, market. It was driven by many things. It was driven by Enzo's imminent death. It was driven by, like Shelby's today, it was driven by um, the baby boomers all turning 40. It was driven by an incredibly strong property market, which sounds familiar, an incredibly strong financial market. Um, so these cars have always been, from the mid-70s on, uh, investment grade cars. And uh, I don't see the prices stopping. I'm stunned at $32 million. You know, 20 years ago, I would never have believed that would happen. And, and now I accept it as, okay, that's the new, that's the new entry level. Let's move on to um, the next car, which is a, uh, the California Spiders. We've been seeing some uh, amazing auction sales of California Spiders. Uh, what's, is this the sort of the continuation of the same line of thinking here? Great cars? Beautiful car, gorgeous car. Uh, of course, it didn't have anywhere near the racing <laughs> success of the TR or the GTO, but an absolutely gorgeous car, very user-friendly, does everything right. Um, whereas the GTOs were almost all the same except for the Series 2 uh, with different bodywork, the, uh, the California Spiders evolved uh, from drum brakes to disc brake, from inside plug to outside plug, from long wheelbase to short wheelbase. So you have a pecking order, and uh, you know the the latest greatest short wheelbase with comp features, of course, is going to be the more valuable car. And the covered headlight cars uh, take a big hit in value. They're not, you know, they they're a million and a half or two million dollars less, uh, simply because they're not as beautiful. Um, do you? I mean, what do you think? I mean, um, moving on to maybe the next one, let's because I want to get into some general questions, which is the back to you know more of a race car because this is why a lot of people buy these things. What do you think about this 500 TRC? Huh. And Gorgeous car, uh, very user friendly. The problem with them is they're a four cylinder. They never had a great uh, race history when new. Uh, they have a bad habit of going bang if you miss a shift. Um, <coughs> They're right-hand drive, so they're not as user, or they're almost all right-hand drive, so they're not as user-friendly to most people, or at least most Americans. Um, which is why, again, they're a third the price of a TR. It's a, but it is, you know, obviously they're fantastic looking cars, you oh, know, and that's, yeah, but to it's die a, for good looks, to yeah. die for good looks. Um, and, you know, really user-friendly on the track. Again, a really nice balanced car. 
But, Which, you know, in vintage racing, you're going to have a great view of the back of the pack. Yeah, because you're just not going to have the power. No, no. You're going to finish last. Yeah. <laughs> bad, bad news for $4 million. You finished dead last. But if you move to the next example, so maybe you go from a drop-dead gorgeous car to a car that um, has a little bit more of an acquired taste, right? <laughs> um, which is the, the 340 Mexico. So um, not everybody's favorite looking Ferrari. It's uh, relatively art deco. But, you know, it's good looking in its own way. It's, it's uh, iconic of its period. It, you know, in that styling era, it was exactly the right look. Um, they weren't really successful as race cars, and they're certainly no fun to drive. You know, they have no headroom, steering's heavy, the front suspension is incredibly crude, the brakes are crude, um, you know, which is why they're only $4 million. <laughs> A mere $4 million. So, um, but let's let's think about this, you know, because a lot of people in the car market talk about this this boom in Ferrari prices and compare it to the things going on in the late '80s, uh, that sort of bubble. And you've already sort of distinguished it. Are we? It's not this. Is this a bubble or is this no, a different era? Stop and think about it. You know, in 1988-89, the Japanese stock market was trading at 30,000. It's it's not there today, folks. It's not even close. It's never recovered. Japanese real estate. I remember being driven around by Japanese clients looking at buildings that they said were worth $80 million, and I just scratched my head. Well, today they're not $80 million, they're not $8 million buildings. Um, so I don't think we're in a boom at all because there's no bubble to pop. Ferraris tend to lead the market. When the economy turns around, Ferraris turn around too. So what you're, ha what you're seeing is as not necessarily in Europe, but in the U.S. as the economy has recovered, uh, the market has certainly increased. And whether it's a Dino or a Daytona or a GTO, they have all gone up because they're all collectible. Uh, so I don't think it's a bubble at all. Ask me three years from now, it may be a very different answer. But today, real estate isn't a bubble. Inflation is certainly not a bubble. Um, there's no bubble to pop. Well, that's interesting. Well, let's, you know, even though this is not an, exactly an affordable section of uh, Enzo era, era Ferraris, you did help us put together a list of some of those that are more affordable. Could you just comment on, on each of those, the, the Dino and the 365? They are, of course, the affordable end of the Enzo era. Uh, Dino GT, boy, Dinos have really taken a jump uh, yeah. recently. They have gone up. So. Um, a Dino GT is going to cost you a buck and a half. Uh, a Dino Spider is going to cost you two and a half or three hundred for a good one. Um, 365 2 plus 2s are a relative bargain. Uh, the one sold at uh, Gooding for, I believe, 135 with the premium, uh, which, if you want a collectible 12 cylinder Ferrari, is a heck of a lot of car for the money, and it's user friendly. It, you know, everything works except the air conditioning. The C4. It has always amazed me at, at uh, how undervalued they are because it's certainly the most drivable of the group. Uh, it, you know, it has power steering, it has a AC that's viable, the windows really work. It was built by Pininfarina, so it doesn't have the same issues, rust issues, the Dino or Daytona have. And uh, GTEs, of course, are, you know, the most collectible of the entry, entry, entry level um, 250s. We sold one about a week and a half ago for 125000 The the seller had put a 125 price on it. The bidding reached 125. We sold it, and the bids kept coming in, so we resold it for 135 <laughs> it, within a week. So talk, talk about, you know, we, we were discussing uh, sort of that there are three eras of Ferraris. Obviously, the Enzo era, there were, and then there, there are certainly some interesting cars that have been built after the Enzo era. It's not the, it's not the end all, be all. But what do you think about? some of the better of the post Enzo era Ferraris. What do you think, you know, obviously well, the F40's the, maybe the king of that planet, yes? Well, in terms of appreciation, the king would be the, uh, at the moment, the 288 GTOs. They've taken uh, an incredible jump because there was a lot less built. There was roughly, you know, 280 GTOs and there was 1,200 F40's. But um, you have essentially the Enzo era, which is 1946, 47, up to 74. You then have the Fiat era with the dreaded cam belts and the, you know, the 
EPA enforced bumpers and side lights and smog and so forth. So the Fiat era cars from 74 to roughly 92, um, you know, there's nothing investable, there's nothing that's an investment grade in there except the 288 and the F40. Uh, when you get to the Montezamolo era in the early 1990s, you have, of course, the F50 and the Enzo. But that's about it that's collectible. Also, Ferraris, in my opinion, peeing in their own soup because, um, as a quick example, they have the Aperta, which is the newest convertible, and they claim they built um, 80, but I have 120 in my database, and, and we're adding more. So, you know, it's, it's one of 80, except there's 40 or 50 extras. They're artist proofs. Yes. Yeah. And what's very, very interesting is the prototype of the 5.9 Aperta has the same chassis number as the U.S. model California. Yeah. So, you know, Ferrari's still playing the same games today. So sort of the last question that I want to ask about this, and then we'll see if there are any questions before we move on, and then we'll have a chance to come back, is what is it about the restoration costs of Enzo-era Ferraris? I mean, I'm hearing that to take a, you know, depending on how complete it is, that you can be looking at a restoration cost in the six, seven, eight hundred thousand dollar range to get a car ready to go win at Pebble Beach. Is this why? I mean, does it cost that much more to paint a Ferrari? <laughs> well, that's part of what we talked about at breakfast, wasn't it? Um, the, the pinnacle of Ferrari collecting is a GTO, and the pinnacle of Ferrari shows is Pebble Beach. And if you want to go to Cavallino at $200,000 restoration, it's just fine. Thank you very much. But if you want to go to Pebble Beach and play at Pebble Beach, you want to be a serious contender, the, the price is all triple. It, it truly, truly gets into fantasy land. You, you're talking, I, I know of just countless examples that are $600,000 plus. Um, and, you know, and those are cars that are already done. The cars that are in the works are going to be, <laughs> well, it, it's getting pretty crazy out there. You, you simply are restoring the cars to standards that never existed when they were new. I assure you that Pin and Farina or, uh, or Scaglietti didn't spend 2,000 hours fitting bumpers and headlight covers on a car. <laughs> the math didn't work. The math just does not work. Well, let's, um, why don't we open it up if there are any questions for you right now while we, are, while we have Ferrari fresh on our mind. Does anyone uh, have something they'd like to ask Michael, our expert here, about the Ferrari market, about the, any part of the Ferrari market? He's a wealth of knowledge. So. Clearly, there's a question right back here in the white shirt. Uh, the PTCs? Yes. The, the four sort of um, gold standard of the, of the production Enzo era are the Daytona, the Dino, the 330 GTC, and the C4. Uh, and the C4 has always lagged behind, but the 330 GTCs have done really well. They've, they've taken a big jump lately. It's really interesting. Those four cars take turns going up. So the Daytona was the first one to cross 300. Now Dino's have crossed 300s. The 330s are starting to cross 300s. And C4s <coughs> haven't gone anywhere, which is sad but true. Other questions for Michael? Yes. Yes, two questions. Uh, if, you were, if you were taking a drivable Enzo era Ferrari and restoring it to uh, factory standards versus Pebble Beach standards, how much would the difference in the restoration cost be? And secondly, how do 330 GTs fit in all of this uh, mix? Well, the 330 GT, unfortunately, is not a very attractive car. Um, <clears throat> we sold one a few um, six weeks ago for a hundred grand. Um, and it costs the same to restore a 332 plus two, a 330 GTC, or a uh, they're all going to cost you 150 or 200 grand. So um, you fall into the diminishing return trap on 332 plus 2. The cost of restoration exceeds the value of the car. Uh, and it's really easy to go down that path because with restorations, once you start, there's no stopping point. You know, unless you have a self -impo you're smart enough to have a self-imposed stopping point and then listening to yourself. Like remodeling your house. Oh, I yes. could write a book. Yeah. You know, you'll, if you start with the kitchen, you're, you're doomed. done. You're, doomed. you're done. You're done. Yes, so, any other questions for Michael? And then we'll. Yes, sir. Uh, 275 Spider sold, I think, uh, in Arizona recently for in the 700s. Is 
that an aberration or is that the mark? Um, I personally think that was a bit of an aberration. Um, you know, they're, they look like Fiat 124s. Um, they're fun to drive, but I think that was uh, a bit over market. I think it was uh, 150 over market. But of course, it depends on the car. You, you know, if somebody just dropped 200 into the car, you can justify the price. And to answer the earlier questions, restorations start at about a buck and a half and go to two and a half. Once you go to Pebble Beach, just quadruple everything. Quadruple it. Wow. Oh, I, I guess I'll remember that next time I'm out at Pebble Beach. I'm getting time. depressed. <laughs> I know, I'm getting depressed. <laughs> I'm going to go and, sell, and sell what, more insurance. No. And, and what's amazing is the restoration shops are not getting rich. Yeah. You know, restoration shop owners don't fly Learjets and, you know, don't have second homes and, you know, wherever. Yeah. You know, they put in grueling hours. It's uh, Just to make it perfect. Well, there's, there's only two shops that have ever scored 100 points at Pebble Beach being Motion Products and, uh, and Bobby Smith. So if you're going there, bring your checkbook. As a matter of fact, bring two checkbooks. Yeah. All right. Well, we'll end on that. We'll have a chance to come back to Michael in a minute. And so we're going we're gonna to turn to a, a different um, side of the equation and uh, to Colin Comer. And we are going to talk about Shelby's. It's the 50th anniversary. We have a 50th anniversary happening this year. Yep. Um, there's, you know, the... There's a, always been a lot of energy around Shelby's, but you know, a little bit. Let's let's follow the pattern like we did with uh, with the Ferrari market, and let's talk about the the big dog in the Shelby world, which is the Daytona Coupe. So, tell us about the Daytona Coupe, Colin, and uh, what what makes it so special. Well, the Daytona Coupe, um, you know, Mike was talking about the 250 GTO being the ultimate evolution of type, is what the FAA called for the. Uh, manufacturer's championship for GT cars. So um, the difference between, I mean, the, the Cobra Daytona Coupe and the 250 GTO were competing for the same title. The difference between Carroll Shelby's interpretation of what evolution of type meant for the Cobra Roadster and what Enzo Ferrari's understanding of evolution of type were a little different. Shelby used a Cobra Roadster chassis, and Enzo Ferrari made a new car with the same wheelbase and track. Um, and called it evolution of type. <laughs> so um, the Daytona Coupe is, I mean, they made six of them. They all exist. Uh, they almost didn't exist at one point where Shelby wanted them dropped off in the North Sea because he didn't want to pay to ship them home from Europe. Um, but luckily they survived. Um, I think the, um, the values of them have always seemed to be, I know it sounds silly to say that there's a car that could be on bargain at $10 million, which is where we see them trading now. But uh, when you compare it to a 250 GTO, uh, there's six of them versus 39 GTOs. Um, you know, they. I think it would be it would be quite interesting if Enzo Ferrari didn't protest the FAA and have the last race of the '64 season canceled. He had Monza canceled because he was worried that these Daytona Coupes were going to eat the GTOs' lunch. So he got the race killed, and that was it for the Daytona Coupe. Um, you know, they, they didn't race again, so. I didn't know there was politics in racing. There, slight <laughs> level of politics no. in racing, okay. and no. between Carroll Shelby and Enzo Ferrari, there, once in a while there's a little friction, but not, not much. <laughs> <laughs> well, that's, a, I mean, obviously, it's a, you know, it's an, another one of those iconic cars just sort of in the nosebleed realm, and I, I, they probably would never trade for less than what we No, and, and, and like a 250 GTO, when, a Daytona Coupe comes up for sale, you just have to pay what it takes to buy it. Now, uh, CSX 2601, the car in the pictures there, you know, I was shocked that that car didn't find a home real easily when it came to market. Um, that's the car that Bondurant won the championship in. Um, I mean, it, the problem is it's like uh, real estate. If there's not a comparable sale for people to base what they feel comfortable paying uh, on, it, it, it Sometimes it's hard to pull a buyer along and tell them this is what you, you have to do. So maybe the rarity in that instance is what kind of made it more difficult to set that. Right. And, the, and the, the sad part for me is that there's six of these cars, and with the last sale of that car uh, that is now in Argentina, we have three of them left in the States and three of them elsewhere in the world, which um, I'm positive that the next one that sells is going to be a European buyer as well, and we'll have 
two of them left here. <laughs> so as time goes on, it's unfortunate that we, we are losing them. But um, of the comp Cobras, I mean, they made roughly 41 uh, leaf spring competition Cobras plus the six Daytona Coupes. I mean, it's, it's the top dog. Well, let's, let's talk about um, a 289 Cobra, the, this uh, factory, the competition car, team car. So tell us about this and kind of where, why this was a good sale or what do you, what do you think about this? Well, this was, car? I mean, this was the, the perfect storm as far as a uh, competition Cobra sale. This was a car that was out of long-term ownership. Uh, the fellow owned it, I think, since 1968. Uh, CSX 2129, it was the, the third leaf spring uh, rack and pinion steering comp car. They, Shelby loosely grouped their competition cars by the race they were prepared for. So these were Sebring cars. They had three Sebring cars, two black cars, and then the red car was the, was the third of the three. Um, and this was primarily Ken Miles' car. So Ken Miles raced this Cobra more than any other Cobra uh, that there is. And, you know, it had another driver, this Bob Bondurant guy. So um, the the race history of this car was, I mean, the driver history, you know, long-term owner, hadn't been in the marketplace. Um, and if you want a 289 Comp Cobra, they just don't come up for sale. Uh, the last one we saw at public auction, uh, rack and pinion steering leaf spring Comp Cobra was um, the ex Tom Payne car, 2430, that was at Mecham in May of 2009, I think. It, it was a no sale, like a million one or a million two, and it sold shortly after that for around that number. Um, but again, it, you know, uh, Ken Miles' Comp Cobra comes up, and if you wanted that car, that's, you know, that's what you had to pay. That's what you had to pay. Let's talk about street Cobras, though. On yeah. to that, I think we have a um, 427 coming up next. Yes, this one. Um, I don't know if you remember that car, but tell, tell us about, uh, well, we'll start with big blocks. So. You know, we're going to see some of those around, certainly this weekend. Um, yeah. Uh, 427 Street Cobras are, are <laughs> it's a complicated subject if you really start breaking the numbers down. They made 260 427 Street Cobras. Out of that 260 cars, roughly 100 cars were delivered new with a 428 police interceptor engine, the same engines in your GT500, um, which ostensibly was because of a supply shortage uh, from Ford, which actually turned out to be a cost savings for Carroll Shelby. He was cheap. <laughs> <laughs> so um, it's, the 428 cars are the 3200 chassis number cars um, with I think five exceptions. Um, this car it sold at RM was a 3200 chassis car, really nice low mileage legitimate car that it had a 427 engine put into it. Huh. Um, like many of them have. I mean, guys found out they had a 428, and 428s blow up easier than 427s. Uh, so it had, it had uh, much like Carol, it had a heart transplant. I see. Um, and in, to Shelby guys, the 428 cars are, you know, they discount them. Um, if you buy a 427, I guess you want a 427. But, uh, you know, we're seeing in private sales, the, a 427 streetcar with its original 427 engine came from the factory of the 427. I mean, they, they broke the million dollar mark, uh, you know, 18 months ago, um, and they should. There's, you take the 160 cars that don't have a 428, and you apply the attrition rate to them, and like we talked about this morning, you just take the number of Cobras divided by the number of bridge abutments uh, on, you know, next to highways in yes. the United States, and you have a large number of cars that were wrapped around them. Yeah. So, I mean, I, at one time I went through the registry and the list and I figured out that there were about, you know, 20 some odd cars that hadn't been hurt, you know, critically injured and hadn't had a, a transplanted motor. So it's, it's a, you know, it doesn't make, it, it doesn't surprise that they're trading for what they are. It's not surprising. I heard a story, I met a guy who actually took a test drive in a, in a 427 Cobra out of the Beverly Hills dealership or whatever and totaled it on the test drive. That had to be a pretty embarrassing return to the dealership. Um, you know, I wonder if you bought hey, it. By the way, hey, yeah, <laughs> <laughs> I'm sure it's, it's probably that one. Well, you never know. So back it's not that one. Don't get us in trouble. No, no. <laughs> so how about the small blocks, though? I mean, these are the cars that many people think uh, are more fun to drive, more like a sports car. You know, we can relate to this thing. Yeah, the, the small block cars are more fun to drive. Um, it's not that a big block car is horrible and the small block car is great. 
It's just the small block car is a little more like a sports car. It's, it's more stiffly sprung, uh, skinny tires, skinny wheels. Uh, the 289 is a quicker revving engine. The shifter falls more easily to hand. Um, they are, there's a reason why the 289 comp cars had such a great competition history and the, and the 427s did not. Um, the 289 is, is a great, great little car. And it, as a street car, you know, everybody complains that you know, a big block gets really hot and they're uncomfortable to drive. I've got tens of thousands of miles of small block Cobras. They get just as hot as a 427. <laughs> if you're in a Cobra, you're, you're going to melt your shoes. So you can get past that deal. Um, if you're going to have to drive one day in, day out, take a road trip, a road rally, a, a small block car is, I think, a, the better mount. All right, let's, let's shift gear to the other part of the Shelby family and, and talk about the most expensive Mustangs in the world. Um, <laughs> Tell us about this sale. Uh, we were talking about this before, and that's uh, one of the GT 350Rs, well, supposedly, right? Right. But this is an um, interesting story and a great example of why if you ever want to buy one of these, you need to work with an expert like Colin. So why don't you tell the story, what, this, what happened with this thing? Well, they built 36R model Shelby's uh, competition. They didn't call them R models originally. They were, they were competition cars. Uh, and this... Number is kind of right? this is number 37. <laughs> <laughs> um, it the water is kind of murky on this subject. This car started life as a street car. Now Shelby 65 GT 350s uh, either had a street car seal number with an S or they were a competition car with an R in the VIN hence R models. This car was originally uh, 5S021. It was an early you know advanced prototype street car. Um, it was sold to Ford when it was new, and was a PR demo car. And then when Ford returned it to Shelby, Shelby decided couldn't get rid of the car, so he sold it to his driving school to use in the Carroll Shelby School High Performance Driving for $3,000. So that's a good way to sell a car, I guess, to yourself. Yeah. Um, it went to the driving school, the, the warranty record, you know, Shelby records, they have this warranty record. It went through engines and transmissions and all this stuff. It had about 30,000 miles in it, on it in 1967, and they needed to sell it again. So they took the MSO and the serial number for 5R537, applied it to 5SO21, and sold it as a competition car. Now, I don't know if that's because there was an odometer disclosure. You put a comp car speedometer in it. It's suddenly a new car again. Um, Carol wouldn't do that, would he? Not no, not at all. It must have been somebody working way <laughs> underneath them that he didn't know about. Um, the funny part is that the real 537 uh, was used as the prototype for the 67 GT500s. So Ford had sent them inner fenders for a 67 Mustang. They put a 427, you know, dual quad engine in it, sent to the Arizona Proving Grounds, you know, developed the 427 platform with the real 537. And when Shelby shut down in August of 67, a Shelby employee bought 5R537 by its Ford VIN number because they didn't have a title or an MSO because they'd already used it to sell another car. Ah. So today both cars exist. Uh, the real R model is in Florida being restored, last I heard. And then we have the car that, you know, and it's not, it's not, they're not being dishonest. It had that VIN number applied at Shelby, but there are two of them. Yeah, so it tip, I mean, it would be double that, almost in price. If it right, were so that's why that, I mean, our models, the 36R models, they reliably trade, you know, $600,000 to $800,000. So having this one, it, I mean, there's a reason. If something is cheap, there's a reason. So that's, the people that have purchased this car know what it is. I mean, yeah. it's, it's a, it has an interesting history. It's a competition car, and it, it you know, sold at a $300,000 discount. Well, let's talk about a regular GT350, which is the next car. You know, is this the market, you know, this day? You know, $400,000, $385? That's a little bit of Barrett-Jackson magic um, and a little bit of creative ad copy. Um, survivor cars are obviously the big, you know, buzzword now, original unrestored cars. Um, this car was advertised as being a, a barn find, untouched original car. It really wasn't. Um, it, was, it was a drag race. It had been found in a garage and then sold, but... The whole, you know, the engine compartment had been painted white at one time. The original engine was out of it. Um, it was fluffed up and cleaned up, and 
good, you know, nice, solid old car that needed a restoration at this point. It was, it was too far beyond a survivor to be considered one um, and not nice enough to be, you know, anything a guy like shiny cars would want to own. Um, but it's very hard to get a 65 GT350 right now with, in, with its original engine. So um, this may not be the market now, but I think in the next 12 months they're going to be right around there. I don't want to ask the indelicate question moving on from the specific examples, but, you know, a lot of people have been, I guess, sort of, you know, uh, Carol is turning 90 or turned 90. Just turned 90, yeah. Um, he has the longest lasting heart transplant ever of anybody in the world. Yeah. People have been saying, are, has the market already priced in um, Carol passing, or uh, what, what do you well, think about that? I think there's a lot of speculation both on, on both sides. Uh, you know, people that own the cars are thinking they're going to tick up uh, if Carol Shelby passes away, and the people buying the cars are thinking, I better buy one now before he passes away. Um, I mean, it, it's, you don't want to have a celebrity death pool on, on a guy like Carol Shelby, but I mean, the odds are not in his favor at 90 years old. Um, you know, it doesn't take a genius to figure out people don't live to be 150. So, um, yeah, I think there's a little speculation on both sides. Will it, has it driven the market? No, I don't think so. I think it's uh, interesting, you know, like, well, if this happens, maybe you know, they'll tick up, but I don't think it's going to have a, a great effect on it. Um, two quick questions, and then we'll open up to other questions, which is one, obviously, restoration costs of a Shelby is not nearly what you have for Ferraris, right? No, I, I, mean, th I, I think I'm going to start restoring Ferraris. Yeah. <laughs> you, don't, you don't want to do that. You don't want to do that. You don't want to do that. So, uh, you know, what does it cost to, to build a perfectly shiny uh, uh, If you have a Shelby Mustang, like a 65 Shelby Mustang that Everything's there. It doesn't need sheet metal replacement. You know, all the knickknack and special parts are there, but ju it just needs a restoration. I mean, it's, uh, you know, 75000 to 125000 And if you want it to go to a Mustang Club of America or a Shelby uh, National Convention and win the premier award, the absolute highest award you can get, then your restoration is sixty-five grand to eighty-five grand because you need to make it look real crappy. Because <laughs> then you want to put overspray on everything and not make it look nice and put runs in the paint and not wet sand it and buff it. Okay, there we go. And 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 maybe the actually you, you mentioned something earlier which I think is a fascinating point. Right now with GT three fifties, what's the difference in value between one with the, with an original engine and one that's not? I mean, you said this is right now in that world a big deal. Yeah, I think it, I think it's uh, 25, 30 percent. If I had to guess, the difference between an original engine and not an original engine. So a hundred thousand uh, dollars. Yeah, original. and I think the the bigger, the easier way to put it is that it's it's a it's a it's a go no go. I mean, if if the people that are buying these cars today, the 65 GT350s and 29 Cobras, if it doesn't have the original engine, you can discount that car as much as you want. It's going to be hard to sell it. If you have an original engine car with great history and paperwork and all that stuff, it's a very easy sale. And before I ask, how about Sunbeam Tigers? Any of the other crazy, we talked about the Omnis. Any other crazy Shelby <laughs> projects? Pickup trucks. <laughs> well, yeah, the whole Shelby Dodge era, I guess you could consider uh, crazy, but um, yeah, I mean, they're as far as collectability, I mean, they're, you know, the the longer <laughs> down the line you get, the, I guess the less collectible they got. Um, maybe the Omnis, like we were talking about. <laughs> the Omnis. <laughs> but they're coming on strong, actually. Did they've you gone find from being an Omni for 14 grand? Somebody found it? Yeah, what? they've gone from being $5,000 cars, and there's one on eBay right now for like 14000 and Reserve isn't met. Yeah. Ah. <laughs> yeah, if, a, if a GTO tripled in price, it would be $90 million, so there. <laughs> <laughs> All right, any questions for Colin right now? We have a form, uh, here, the gentleman in the green shirt, and then we'll jump over here. So, Or either way, we'll start here and go over there. Oh. I think it's the name, and I think there's a lot of people that, that want a Shelby that, that don't want to go out and spend $300,000 or a million dollars. Um, and it's also a, the, you can use them. Now, I think, I think 1965 to 1967 Mustangs are in a different grouping than 68 to 70, and there really aren't, as you know, there aren't any 70s or leftover 69s that were renumbered. They couldn't sell them when they were new, so 
Um, they, be, they became less of a uh, weekend warrior, kind of drive it to the track and autocross and race it, and more of a grand touring car. Um, and I think the 67s have their own you know, slice of the market. I mean, they're, they're the last cars built by Shelby in California. They have, you know, they look great. Um, you know, first year of the big block. So I think the, you know, 68, when they moved to Michigan, yeah, they're a little, a little less special. And I, you know, obviously I think it's, you know, some people like them and uh, that's why they have a, a following. Right over here, sir, in the front. Or, or there was a question. Yeah, I heard a story about a, three SC Cobras that were left in England that he brought back recently. <laughs> I heard no. a story about some SC Cobra chassis he found in California. <laughs> uh, I, I didn't hear the one about the, the, the three that have recently been unearthed, although last time I checked, they were all accounted for. So yeah. I, I seen one that a man said that he, he's a very private guy. I can't really say his name. And uh, he said Carol Shelby called him and had three of them come back, and he, he bought one of them. Huh. Um, okay. <laughs> I hope he's not here. He's, he's also got a weapon, weapon manufacturing company. All right. Yeah, I, I, I've researched the SCs pretty well, um, and uh, every one of them has been of the every one of the twenty nine cars is accounted for. Yeah. All right, um, I have a question for you, which is, relates to the new Shelbys, the new Shelby GT500s. Is this going to affect, or will this continue? Is this a positive thing for uh, the values, or negative things for the? Oh, values I think it's positive. I think you're. I think it's introducing the the, the Shelby name and, and the history to a whole new demographic. Um, you would think that it would, you know, like the new Camaro. I think kind of pumped up, you know, the awareness of the original, you know, 67, 69 Camaros. Um, but it's an odd phenomenon. I thought that um, original Shelby owners, you know, 65 to 69 Shelby owners would go buy a new one as their daily driver. And actually, I've seen the opposite. I've seen that uh, uh, younger guys are buying a new GT500 or a Super Snake, and then they go home and they start reading books, and they go, huh, they made cars in the 60s, and they <laughs> go and buy one to park next to their new collectible Super Snake. <laughs> so the old cars become their daily driver. Okay. Well, that's cool. That's great. I think we have another question over here. Yes? Colin, is uh, an unrestored car, um, street Cobra, worth more than a, re a restored car? Absolutely. Yeah. Yeah, by, unrestored. by what, what percentage or what value would you say? It depends how nice the unrestored car is. Um, if you're talking, uh, yeah, I think it's probably the same margin on a small block or a big block car, but if it's an original paint car that's just all there and, you know, really a nice preservation class level car, I, I hate to speculate, but I would say it's probably a 20 or 30 percent bump. I mean, it's, it's, it's big because there's not many of them that exist. We've definitely been seeing that as a trend sort of across the market, you know, this interest in preserved cars, cars that have not been restored because, you know, the belief is, is that once it's restored, some of the, you know, the history and the originality is sort of a race from it. They're beautiful and shiny, and yeah. if they're tastefully done, we love restored cars. We all do, but uh, you know, it can a car can only be original once, and so it's uh, you know something that we're starting to see that those rare examples of whatever they are, if they're nicely preserved and original, uh, there's a premium for them. It's especially true with Cobras, I think, because um, if you have a perfectly restored Cobra, it looks like a replica or <laughs> one of the new Cobras that Shelby is building. You can't, I mean. If a CSX 4000 car looks like an original restored 427, and uh, you see it all, I mean, people like a little patina on the car to kind of show that it's old. Like a nice leather jacket. Right. Oh, nicely worn leather jacket. I think we have one more question, or two more questions, and then we'll move on to the final section. You mentioned the continuation cars. Any thoughts on the 4000, 6000, 7000, 8000 series? Um, I think they're a great car for somebody who wants a Cobra that doesn't either want or can't afford an original one. Um, and when they're done correctly, when you get, you know, an alloy bodied one, I mean, Shelby makes some nice cars, Kirkham makes some nice cars. Um, and it's, it's, I think it's cool that you can still walk in to Shelby and order one new, because there's a lot of us that like these cars that weren't able to do that when they were new. So 
Um, I mean, they definitely serve a purpose. They, it, you, can, you can experience 90% of what a Cobra is you know, for the 10% of the cost. So um, future collectability, I think as long as they keep making them, there isn't, they're not going to move up until, I mean, they have to lose a lot of cars. They, may, they make, you know, they crank out a lot of cars. So um, I'm in the insurance business, Colin. We don't want to lose any of them. No, yeah. I'm kidding. <laughs> um, no, it's all right. <laughs> People will be paid. One last question, and then we'll move on to the blue. About the, um, the, continuation the continuation Cobras, um, same same comment. I don't I don't uh, I wouldn't buy one for investment. I buy one to use it. Um, new you I mean it, it's about one hundred twenty five, one hundred forty thousand dollars to get a new one in the secondary market. They seem to trade in that eighty five to one hundred and ten thousand dollar range. So you you get your money back through the enjoyment you get to use the car, um, and I mean, you'd have to be foolish to go take an original Cobra and go do open track events or um, put it in, in harm's way. So they, like I said, the continuation cars, it's a real Shelby. It's built by Shelby, has a serial number. They're in the registry, and, uh, you know, you can buy them and have fun with them. That's cool. Well, uh, everybody will be around later if you have more questions for them. But let's move on to our last section, and then we have some, some maybe general questions for everybody, and that is, Blue, what we what we call blue chip cars, right, Dave? Tell us a little bit about the blue chip index and these this group of kind of globally collected cars. Uh, when we put together the uh, the index, we we basically thought about basically the automotive A list. It would be like the you know the the people you'd invite first to the Hollywood party. Um, so we have two AC Cobras, a two eighty nine uh, rack and pinion car, four twenty seven. Uh, Aston Martin DB five uh, Bentley Continental drophead uh, uh, S one Continental. BMW 507, Tucker um, 48, uh, a number of different cars on the list, uh, and of course the 300 SL, uh, Gullwing and Roadster. Well, let's let's talk about the Gullwings because you know I've I'm of a, a very firm belief that the the Gullwings and and really also SLs are the maybe the most truly global blue chip collected car. I mean they made there were plenty of them made, and you know, they're collected all over the world, North and South America, they're collected in Asia, they're collected in Europe, and certainly in the United States, and all, many, many of the great collections all have one in, in them. But there was one SL, there was one group of SLs in particular that really stands out, and this is the, the alloy car, so. Yeah, the alloy bodied cars are the, you know, the first of the, uh, or among the first of the, of the gull wings built, and they kind of have it all going on. They've got, uh, they've got the style of the 300 SL gull wing, they are a lightweight car. Um, and, you know, as such, with very limited production, um, this $4.62 million originally kind of astonished all of us, I think, when it happened at Gooding. Uh, there had been a $3 million reported sale earlier, um, but I think when we kind of sit back and think about it, it makes a little more sense. Of course, one sale does not make a market, and so we have to be real careful about that, but I don't think I'd be astonished if the next one went for three eight and the one after that went 5.2, you know, something like that. So I think we, we've probably established a, a new market price on these cars just within the last, uh, in the last few months. They very, very rarely come up for sale. The one that uh, was well known before was out of a, uh, that, that came up about six years ago, was out of a uh, private collection in California, and it was extensively raced and then put back on the street. Uh, so it did have some interesting history to it, and that was a, a two or two point five million dollar car. So what we've got, you know, I wrote a piece years ago, and I said that if uh, you know if penguins could buy cars, they'd be worth the same on Antarctica as well. I mean, they're just a, a car that you can kind of take uh, from from you know from Asia to Europe to the United States, and they, they relatively sell for the same price. Now there's taxation issues and things like that that come into play, and then you know international currencies and variations. But they are the kind of the of the automotive world, the 300 SL is the gold brick. Well, let's look at a regular one, which is the next the next group. And obviously, we've all probably been seeing Gullwing. They sell in almost every major auction, and they've certainly been climbing up. I mean, they were, again, fantastically engineered, very expensive to build. You know, I mean, the rumor is they lost money on every single one that they made, but wonderful to drive. I mean, they absolutely work. And 
boy, I can, I've been in a, a few rallies where they're just like sailing by me and whatever I'm driving and they just, everybody looks so regal in them. And yeah, they really except for when it's me. hot out. And when it's hot problem. out, then they, they look really warm. They are an easy bake yes. oven. That's why you see them every once in a while with the gull wing doors extended in events. Um, they get very, very hot inside. Um, but uh, yeah, 869 on this car. We have seen these cars at over a million dollars. I think, uh, interestingly, RM sold one last year in Phoenix. And uh, the rumor is, and I just love the story, I don't know if it's true, um, sold for a million three, I believe, or a million three and a half, and it had the same born-on date in 1954 as the new owner. Uh, so he was pretty determined that he would buy a car that was built on his birthday. And, and I'm sure that he didn't tell that to the auction company, you know. Yeah, right. Uh, no, never. Yeah. Yes. Exactly. Hey, so. I was born the same day I was. I really want it. Yeah, it, you know, it's so, it, it's a pretty neat trinket. Yeah. You'll never forget the day that your car was made, I guess, that way. But uh, yeah. but anyhow, yeah, we see these cars as, as anywhere from kind of in the 700 to a million two range. Um, and the better restored cars and the cars that were restored by the big names, the Paul Russells uh, in the industry and a, and a couple of other shops bring more money basically because they're worth more. Um, they're restored more likely to what we'd call a, a Pebble Beach standard. Um, but anytime you can find a 300 SL, a Gullwing, in any kind of condition, it's always worth big money. And it always draws a huge crowd. And you'll always see uh, telephone bidding on almost every 300 SL because you don't know where they're going to go. They could go to Europe. They could go across the street. Uh, quite a few of them built, uh, you know, relatively for, you know, for some of the, the other cars that are in this uh, blue chip index and other cars that we uh, were speaking of, but that doesn't seem to hurt it. And uh, I have a feeling the more Mercedes-Benz worlds they build around the world, each one of them sucks up a 300 SL. So, yeah. so you, you, every time they build a new Mercedes-Benz center, one more goes off the market. So. I, I was judging at a Concord not, not long ago, I learned an interesting fact about Goings. If you were a military officer that, apparently, if you're a military officer, US military officer that fought in World War II, and you came home and bought, ordered a Gullwing or an SL, you could get paid $1,000 in war reparations directly to you to, to uh, Help pay for the buy car. a car, get der check, huh? Uh, yes, that's right. <laughs> and and the guy actually had the canceled check from, from the factory, and it said in the memo field, war reparations to Colonel so and so or whatever. That was fascinating. But that's a twenty, you know, twenty five percent discount, twenty percent discount, something like that. Yeah, they were like first. five, six thousand dollar cars when new, something yeah, like fantastic. that. Yeah, fantastic. So, um, but uh, uh, what do you th roadsters versus? Uh, Coops right now versus going. You know, uh, about a year ago, we started to see parity between the late Roadsters and the Gullwings in terms of price. Uh, the later Gullwing, uh, the later Roadsters uh, have uh, disc brakes. Uh, they have a number of refinements. I think they're an easier car to drive, an easier car to love. I like the Roadster a little bit better than the uh, than the Gullwing. How styling tall are you design. though? I mean, I'm six four. Okay, well, so, yeah, you yeah. can't fit so, in a road. You can't yeah, fit. I uh, I hit the roof of uh, well, just about everything, but. Uh, um, but that, that's part of the problem. But uh, I like the Roadsters for the way they drive. But they're a later version. Uh, you know, it, it's, it would be, I'd be hard pressed to say a later version of the same car. They're a later version of a similar car because there are many, many design changes throughout the production. And after 1961, when they got disc brakes, well, those cars seem to be worth quite a bit more. And the very latest, the last build cars, uh, seem to be worth the, the very most in the Roadsters. So let's move on to the next car. Let's change gears um, out of Gull Wings. And uh, hey, you know, Tuckers have been going up, but it's this. What happened at the Bitters Bar here at, in Scottsdale? Yeah, this is a real yeah. shocker. Um, uh, you know, we had recently been talking about Tuckers as, uh, you know, four years ago, they were a $750,000 car, $800,675, right into there. They popped through a million dollars and they're a legitimate member of the million dollar club there's no doubt about it 51 of them built what 53 of them exist today um, and the convertible yeah and uh, the convertible but uh, yep. no they're actually pretty well documented the Tucker Club does a great job with that but there were you know there were cars and parts that were made up of other things and I think we're you know the the world the Tucker world is pretty much aware of it the Tucker World 51 cars. Uh, but um, this was a shocker. Uh, this was Ron Pratt's car, um, sold at Barrett-Jackson. I don't know what happened here now. I'm waiting for word about uh, the Gooding sale that's happening right now. I haven't gotten the text yet. Um, but uh, they also have a Tucker. It's late in their sale. And um, I'm, 
I, I'll go out on a limb and say it's probably a million three, mm -hmm. uh, something like that. I mean, I'd be very, very surprised if it breaks the uh, <clears throat> the two to two million dollar barrier. Um, I don't see these cars currently as three million dollar cars, but this car came very, very close. I, you know, you know, it could be auction lubrication, aka alcohol. Uh, it could be somebody who didn't. It might know, have been late at night. It, it is possible that. That's it, it could have been somebody who you know figured that was his best chance to get on TV. I don't know, um, but it would be interesting to see. I mean, that's going to make a lot of people's. You know, when whenever something like this, a big jump happens to automobiles, more of them come on the market. Yeah. If uh, you know, if you've been thinking of your car as an eight hundred thousand dollar car, and all of a sudden it's worth supposedly two million more, um, that might change whether your retirement involves a, uh, you know, a mini Winneba Winnebago or a house on the beach. So sure. uh, that can make a big difference. But certainly the most valuable post-war American car. Yeah, absolutely. In a class by yeah. itself, as, yeah. as far as that goes. Uniquely, a uniquely American car, the greatest backstory probably of any automobile, Preston Tucker, absolutely a wild man um you know it, it, the movie which you know pretty much held true to a movie. lot of the story um um you know in in many respects was was a true american hero a genius and a guy who got shot down in the prime let's talk about lamborghinis we talked about ferraris a lot earlier um tell tell us about uh because i think we have uh, miuras on the on the blue chip index, so we we certainly do. The, there are three series of Miras, basically the uh, the 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 early ones, the P four hundreds, and then the S's, and then the SVs. The SVs are the the B plus Ultra, the you know the ones that seem to bring the most uh, uh, the most attention. I'm a big fan of the P four hundreds, the early builds. I think they're prettier. Um, I can't stand the fact that I remember these cars when new and they were Kermit in a blender green and they were electric blue and they were white and they were all these great factory colors. What did you call them? You had a word for it? Uh, Kawasaki colors. Kawasaki, Kawasaki colors. colors. Yeah, lifesaver yeah. colors. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, you know, they were just wild, wild cars when new. Uh, and they had the, uh, the eyelashes on the headlights on the early cars, all that. Um, they are a very fragile car, um, like a lot of the cars from its era. Um, the hood was built so that if you forgot to secure it and drove off, you would lose the entire back bodywork of the car. Um, in, in that wonderful... And that never happened, <coughs> I'm sure, no. Right. no. Yeah. <laughs> As an insurance guy, you wouldn't know anything about no. that, I'm sure. But, uh, no. but anyhow, uh, so... Uh, <laughs> you you know, what? <laughs> really the ultimate in, in impractical cars in some ways. And I just love them to death. I mean, you know, if, if I had the money, and my wife is very tolerant, but if she was... 20% more tolerant, I would buy one and put it in our living room and have it so that I could take it out every, uh, uh, you know, every few months and exercise it because I think of the cars as automotive art. Who would drive it? Uh, yeah, I, well, yeah, you couldn't fit. I, I want you to know I have witnesses here on this island who can prove to you that I drove one from Columbia, Missouri to Washington, D.C. It was also the first time I ever experienced a chiropractor shortly thereafter. Um, um, but, uh, and, and it was, it was among the longest four days of my entire life, I will tell you that. So, uh, anyhow, apologies. Um, the, uh, the cars are not built for tall people, they're not built for big people, but they are great looking cars. Let's talk about another one on the index that uh, people might not uh, expect, which is the BMW 507s. We've seen these climb up towards a million dollars. Beautiful car. Um, what do you think? Did you just get the text? How much the text? I didn't. For? It wasn't the text, unfortunately. Okay. It's no, just another bill collector. He's sorry. Up here. Um, no, the uh, the 507 again. You know, it kind of uh, the best way to think of the 507 is the competitor to the um, uh, to the 300 SL in many ways. A two uh, two door two passenger sport car, front engine. Uh, these were V8. The uh, uh, the SLs were uh, inline sixes. Uh, they're fantastic cars. I love the way these cars drive. They're my favorites of, uh, of this era. Um, when BMW brought out the Z8 a few years back, it was uh, basically, in many ways, a tribute to the 507. They built 253 of them. Raymond Lowy, my favorite designer, ruined one of them when new. Uh, that car still <laughs> exists. But um, uh, so there's, there's only 250 on the market, basically. And um, they are a newer member of the Million Dollar Club. There were two cars that sold in Phoenix, um, both of them right around the million dollar mark. And um, uh, 
that's where those cars are going to stay. Now this one, the one that sold at RM, was an RM restoration. They're a very good restoration shop. It also came with a replacement BMW 507 motor uh, that was actually put into that car just a few years back, maybe eight or ten years ago. A uh, uh, 507 motor was, re uh, was repatriated, I guess, with the car. Uh, and this car was from Puerto Rico, spent a lot of years there. Um, I remember these cars back when they were five and six and seven thousand dollar cars. Uh, I say deservedly so on the million dollar list. I had a gentleman come up to me and um, recently with a, um, he's been watching the prices of these, but he told me that he has a Gullwing, a 300 SL, and a 507. And he, he said, drives the 507. Yeah, we said, what should I do? And he said, I'm like, celebrate, man. I mean, you are the <laughs> luckiest guy alive. That's absolutely fantastic. So. Tell us a little bit about the index, and for those of you, uh, if, you're, if you're interested in this part of the car world, our, our view of this blue chip index is that, again, these are cars that have sort of international appeal. They tend to, they tend to be the type of cars that you know, fit very well in lots of different types of collections. But cars kind of come and go from this list, right? We, you know, we're watching different things. How do you? Yeah, we work? have we have a few that that might not stay on the list, and one of the reasons why is because they're just not all that uh, widely traded. So uh, we have a, uh, an Iso Grifo that's on there that that might be falling off, and this is in the in the great tradition of uh, this sort of list. I mean, you know. Dow Jones took, uh, you know, the Union Pacific Railroad off quite a few years ago, uh, you know, things like that. And uh, we have uh, uh, an Alfa Romeo TZ2, uh, uh, what, that's the perfect example of a handful built and, and many, many more existing today. But we keep the index at Haggerty.com and you can go and take a look under the, uh, the index that we have for valuation tools. And you can take a look at it and, and kind of go back and forth and, and you can price, uh, uh, the value of a number of different indexes, to be fair, we, we didn't put housing prices on or things like that yeah. that would just depress you. But uh, um, obviously gold beats our index every single time, but I like to say that you can't drive gold. And it's kind of hard to leverage it as well, where it's a, a little bit easier to leverage uh, you know, some of these automotive investments. So um, for now, we have the same original uh, components to the list put together at a hotel room at, uh, I think we ended at midnight in Renton, Washington, a place that you don't want to be if you're looking for good restaurants, by the way. Um, but um, anyhow, uh, you know, we, we went through a list of cars and kind of parried down from 100 cars to where we are. Well, Porsche 356s are certainly something, maybe it would be a subject for another seminar sometime. Uh, yeah, they, they've been... 73 RSs, that sort of thing. You know, but just that's, a, that's another subject. Rocking so the we'll world get there. right now. So let's, let's, I just, I have a sort of general question that I wanted to ask all of you, and then we'll open it up to questions for Dave, questions for anyone, and that is um, the sort of current global situation. You know, I, I had the benefit recently of going over to, I was in Singapore two weeks ago, I'd never, be, I'd been to Asia a couple of times, but I'd never seen um, that part of South Asia, and I was just blown away by the growth that was happening over there, and the number of cars that were there, and other than the fact that there are no roads around Singapore, a very small place. I mean, there were a lot of very serious uh, cars driving around. So what, tell us about these cars in general. For, where, where are you seeing the energy globally from a collecting and classic car market? Um, each of you want to, we can, Dave, and we'll just go right down the line. We'll go backwards. Well, I think that, um, you know, it, it's interesting. We, we all think that, that, that these cars exist for a moment, and I think they're existing for a lot longer than that. Um, you know, the, the advice, uh, you know, to somebody who's buying a, a collectible car is to buy the best you can afford, um, you know, just like everything else. The market is expanding and keeps expanding. I think, you know, uh, we could go into some of the economic reasons why. Um, it's basically a pretty safe place to put money in a time that's not terribly inflationary. Um, you know, you can insure against loss. Um, you can actually use the cars. Um, you can, you know, you can, uh, you know, basically enter them and, and beware of whatever level you'd like in, in, in terms of just what it is that you're looking to do. Um, there is a line of reasoning that says that as the baby boomers age, all cars will, uh, you know, the, the, uh, uh, the dynamics will change. It will. Uh, when I first got into the old car market, uh, you go to Hershey and it was nothing but rows of Model Ts and Model As, but we've accepted that. We've moved on. Now it's nothing but rows of Mustangs and Camaros. So mm -hmm. there you are. Okay. Alan, what do you think about the global market? Where are you seeing cars sell more? Are you shipping any anywhere? Or what do you see? Uh, yeah, we, what I've seen is, in a, obviously, the cars are in my wheelhouse are, 
are uniquely American products uh, by and large. So um, competition cars, 1965 and earlier, you know, factory competition cars um, are a worldwide commodity. I mean, it, it's, uh, they race a lot more in Europe than they do here with these historically, you know, correct cars with good histories and, and that kind of stuff. Um, you know, a 427 Cobra is not something that they want to drive, you know, anywhere else in the world, it seems. Fuel prices are one, um, plus event eligibility. You can't go on the Tour Auto in a 1966 or 1967 uh, Cobra or a lot of these FIA events, um, you know, Goodwood Festival, Speed and all this, I mean, all have pretty strict cutoff uh, dates. So, um, you know, I've shipped cars, uh, you know, the only cars that I've shipped out of the country uh, by and large are race cars. And, uh, you know, and it's it's nice to see that, that there are people out there that want to buy them and run them, and they run them hard. I mean, I just sold a... Uh, uh, a car was in my collection for a long time. I sold my, my R model GT350 last year. Uh, I went to Switzerland, and they sent me pictures. They put mufflers on it, and the guy drives it on the road and then races it, like, you know, unbolts the mufflers and goes and races it. So they have this strict noise regulations and all this stuff, so you, like, doctored it up so you could drive it every day and then go race it. So um, that's, that's the kind of uh, the worldwide market I see seems to be kind of focused on competition stuff. Michael, what do you think? Put, step up to the microphone there a little bit closer and tell us. As we discussed this morning, um, I wake up every morning, I read the Wall Street Journal, I read all the business publications because uh, currencies make a difference, at least for me. I've watched that happen for 25 years. Um, Japan at one time was the biggest market. It's a non-market. It doesn't exist as a market. Today, the market is essentially the US. Because of problems in the Eurozone, um, the Europeans are very, very nervous, except the very, very top end, the, the, the most, the GTOs, the TRs, and so forth. The, the middle market and the lower market, not there. Um, Canada is really coming on strong simply because uh, their economy is doing well. And the Australians have been buying a lot from me, which really amazes me. But in Australia, it's, it's, um, they have an exemption for race cars. So we've sold multiple 333 SPs, multiple uh, F40 LMs, GTEs to Australia, which you'd never think would happen, but there's sort of a $850,000 price point that seems to work for them. And not one collector, but a whole group of collectors. So um, the one point that's, that's important from the seminar, I think, is that the cars I talk about, the cars Colin talks about, the cars Dave talks about, are all going up. As the US economy comes back to some kind of health, and it's not a bubble, but as the US economy comes back to health, the baby boomers, my generation, uh, are buying. And one of the things I tell people is I essentially sell cars for 80-year-olds to 55 or 60-year-olds. Mm -hmm. And you know, I'll, I'll ask the, the 250 GTE we just sold. The seller was 80. That was a younger buyer, he was a 45. But boy, he's the bottom end of the, the spectrum for buying. But so far, China, nothing's selling no. to China. We haven't seen that. At, no, at and there are certain mini markets. Um, Dubai, for instance, is, is buying totally out of proportion. There's a lot of cars going there relative to the tiny size of the, of the country. And it's basically the richest of the rich in Dubai buying toys and taking them over for private collections. Not that they'll ever be used, but they're going there. I have some very interesting requests for some very, very high-end cars that I can't fill uh, for Dubai. Singapore, which you talked about, is really a non-market because they have really high uh, import duties. And you can't import a car to Singapore until a car goes off their registration. Yes, that's right. So Singapore is a non-market. And um, some places like, well, Brunei, for instance, was once a market. Now it isn't uh, because they actually went bankrupt. <laughs> well, so it's uh, a global market, and uh, all of the cars we're talking about are booming. It's, oh, happy days. I'm a happy guy. So that is the, I mean, if there's an overall theme for all of this, it's that all these cars are going up in and, and, and that market. Those are the ones that defied the economy. But I'd like to open it up while we have a couple minutes left to see if anyone has any general questions for everybody. Uh, we didn't give uh, 
uh, or for Dave who, who went last. Um, any questions? Relatively value of the Gull Wings versus Daytonas. You know, both are about 1,200 production, and for years they were about the same. Now the Gull Wings seem to be twice to three times the level. Why is that? My opinion, the Melamilia. Yeah. They they can go to the Melamilia. They can go to the Monterey Historics. A Daytona can't. It's really that simple. So event eligibility. Event eligibility. And also, John, as you well know, I mean, that was a huge build number for the Daytonas uh, when it first came out. I mean, that was, the, those were huge numbers for Ferrari. Yeah. And I, I think it's, it's a laughable number now for Ferrari with 1,400, uh, you know, uh, built. Um, but yeah, I think event eligibility has a lot to do with it. You know, my question actually for, for Michael was, Dino's pushing up Daytona prices? That's a first. I mean, it was, for the longest time, it was... Dino or Daytona, Dino or Daytona, and now you yeah, know, Dino's, they're, Dino's they're playing in the same market. Um, yes and no. Dino's traditionally have been half the price of Daytona's, but Daytona's, the, the, we'll call them the, the gold standard, the 330 GTC, the Dino, the Daytona, the C4, take turns going up, and the Daytona's have crossed the $300,000 mark and sort of stopped at the 325 range at the moment. So Dino's has suddenly taken a big jump. We sold two Dino's in the last 30 days. One was an exceptionally nice car, which brought 300, and one was an exceptionally nice barn find, which uh, we went through mechanically, but it needed paint, but it was the original paint. It needed an interior, but it was original interior, and that sold without ever being advertised for 250. So yes, Dino's uh, are doing extremely well because they're really a wonderful car to drive. They're horribly slow, but every time you take one out, it feels like a warm-up lap for Sebring. You know, the engine makes wonderful noises, and you have to buzz it to make it sound good. You know, you feel like Fangio practicing. Keep it floored the whole time. Yeah, yeah. well, meanwhile, the lady in the Volvo is past you, but, you know, she didn't know she, she, didn't know she was being raced. <laughs> well, with the, uh, with the Gullwyn and the Daytona, uh, I would think that some of it has to do with with styling too, and, and curb appeal, because uh, the Daytonas, as you know, as great as they were when they were new and uh, such a great supercar, um, they haven't aged as well. I don't think. I think the Gowen. You look at a Gowen, and it's an iconic, you know, piece of sculpture you can put in your garage. And I think sex appeal has a lot to do with it. I think uh, that's why Dinos are coming on. I would have to believe because when you sit in a Dino and you have the fenders in front of you, and it's such Great a looking. good looking car. I mean, and people like to show these off as much as they like to drive them anymore, right. so. Right. We have a question over here. Yes, sir. Do any of you have a, a comment about the pre-war classics, American and European? Not I. Dave? Oh, a comment? I mean, a comment on the. I, well, I mean, in terms of value, uh, it's, it's basically, you know, it, it's bifurcated in many ways, but coach built cars. Um, are the cars that, that people have been collecting and seem to be worth the most money in terms of, uh, in terms of keeping them. Um, there's a, an incredible market opportunity, I think, for a number of different cars that have been beaten down in price uh, that there aren't that many of. I think some of the classic Packards, uh, which unfortunately I think we treat like, you know, like we treat a lot of American cars. We don't give them the respect that we give to European cars. Um, but there is a generational shift that's happening right now. The people who bought those cars and restored them in the 60s and 70s, number one, a lot of them were restored in 60s and 70s colors, so you get these white and gold cars or something like that. that brown and orange. Brown and orange that look yes. great, at the, or, or yes. green and yellow would yes. be another one that looked great at the time that haven't weathered so yes. well. And so, um, you know, I think it's a buying opportunity for somebody who wants to restore one of those. But I, you know, you've got record prices on Duesenberg still. Um, you know, there, there's a number of the European makes, Bugatti, uh, Delage, Delahaye, all doing very, very well in terms of the uh, record price. But I think the, uh, it's, it's the more exotic and the coach-built cars that are making the headlines now. And I would add big power brass era cars, anything. I mean, particularly for event eligibility. If you can find, you know, for events like the Great Race, the earlier the car with the bigger the motor, 
you know, that's a car that has appeal to a lot of a lot of folks. And you know, to, to, there's a great, it's a fantastic experience to be, uh, you know, sitting there with your goggles on in a Stutz or something like that. You know, sort of. And, rumbling down the road. And that was something that we talked about 20 years ago with who was going to buy these brass cars because of the guys who kind of had bonded with those and, and they didn't grow up with them. These were the cars of their fathers maybe. Um, but those cars are doing spectacularly well in the marketplace. Everybody's, the, uh, everybody wants one. And it's, <laughs> and it's, one. Right. Yeah. it's event eligibility. I mean, that's exactly what drives it. And, the, and then the pre-1905 cars, the cars that are eligible for the uh, London to Brighton, uh, you know, you just can't find one for under sixty thousand dollars. Generally speaking, uh, you know, the, the bargains are the fifty thousand dollar ones, and the ones you'd want to run are one hundred and twenty-five thousand. Yeah, London to Brighton, you got it's got to make it the sixty-two miles, or it's, it's a it very is wet day. It is basically um, driving a hundred-year-old Sears lawnmower sixty miles. Yes, yes, absolutely. One more question back here, and then uh, these guys will can stick around for a few minutes um, to answer individual questions. Question for Michael: Where is the market going for the two cam, four cam, two seventy-five? GTBs. They're booming along. They're doing very well. Go forward, uh, Michael. They're doing very well. Uh, they're also very iconic. It's it's the Daytona is the the car of the 70s. The 275 is the car of the 60s. The the street car. Um, two cams are sort of 750 for short noses, 900 for long noses. We just sold an alloy for a million two. And four cams are sort of a uh, million two ish. Um, you know, very user friendly. They do everything right. They're wonderful cars. All right, with that, our time is up. And I want to thank everybody for spending 90 minutes with us. Please thank our panelists. And again, as we mentioned, there's a lot of uh, this information. I think we'll have the video out there if you want to pass it on to anybody, anybody at uh, haggerty.com. And you can see those indexes up there at Haggerty.com and Haggerty Price Guide. Thanks for coming, everybody. <laughs>